Welcome to Southern Discomfort. This is one of the most unique podcasts on the internet. Southern tales of the weird, wild, mysterious, unusual, voodoo, Voodoo. cryptids, hauntings. Are you intrigued yet? This is Southern Discomfort. Southern Discomfort. And now, your hosts, April and Christine. Hey, everybody. If you are new and this is your first time, then welcome. And if you are a repeat listener, then welcome back. Hey, everybody. It's Christine. Uh, Just want to remind you guys of our socials and um, to leave us a review and five stars if you feel so inclined. Um, So socials are... Twitter, so Disco PC, uh, Instagram, Southern Discomfort PC, Facebook, Southern Discomfort Podcast, uh, YouTube, Southern Discomfort Podcast. Like, subs- don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell. Uh, comment if you have a story that you want to hear. Um, you can also email us at Southern Discomfort Podcast at gmail.com. And you can find us on Podbean, Southern Discomfort at Podbean.com or wherever you get your podcasts. And uh, so what's the drink du jour? So tonight we have a St. Augustini. So it's a martini. (laughs) I like it. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's owed to what we're going to talk about, our discussion uh, that takes place in St. Augustine, Florida, but it is a vodka martini with cherry juice and it's shaken, not stirred. I like it. And as as always, uh, it's a really pretty drink. I don't know how you always manage to do that. Try. Thank you. We'll have to post a picture of it on Insta. Definitely. Uh, so yeah, this tonight, I'm really excited because, uh, if you listen to our previous episode, um, about Athelia Ponzel Lindsley, um, then you know that it was a, uh, fan suggestion. Um, and we have, uh, a very special treat for you tonight because she's actually in studio with us. Yay. Um, I'd like to introduce Kristen to everybody. Hi, everybody. This is a first. Yay. So we're uh, really excited about this. Uh, What we're going to do is essentially have a deeper dive uh, around the discussion. And um, we're not going to retell the story. Uh, So definitely recommend that you guys go back and listen to their previous episode, um, and then come back and listen to this one. As I said, we're, we're not going to um, tell it, retell it tonight, um, but do want to remind you guys, um, this is about Athelia Ponzel Lindsley. Um, she actually was believed to be born either in Cuba or her mom flew to the United States and um, had her in Ohio. But she grew up in Jacksonville, Florida, in a mansion, um, had a very charmed life. And then as an adult, she and her sister Geraldine moved to New York City and they became uh, part of the social scene there. Um, she did acting, she did modeling, she had uh, a relationship with Joe Kennedy Jr. Um, unfortunately, uh, as listeners know, I'm sure uh, that was short lived as he uh, died in World War II. Anyway, she moved back to Jacksonville after her modeling career dried up in her 30s. Um, she married a couple times um, and then. Uh, when she moved back to Florida, she married for the third time. We talked a lot about her third husband, Jinx, uh, who will, again, revisit that tonight. Um, but some of the notable things about her, um, she wrote a book on gardening. She patented a household invention. Um, she was uh, well-connected in the Jacksonville area, but then 
um, she decided, she and her mother actually decided to sell the Jacksonville mansion and move to St. Augustine where um, she was not accepted in the social circles there, particularly not accepted in her neighborhood, um, which is uh, the house on Marine Street that we covered. And she did have ongoing feuds with her neighbors, which we also discussed previously. Um, But her demise came in January of, or January 23rd of 1974, Um, at around 6 p.m. when she's murdered on the front steps of her St. Augustine mansion. Um, So definitely go back and listen to the first one. This episode will uh, make a lot more sense to you uh, if you do that. But again, super excited to have Kristen here. And um, I'm going to pass the mic. (laughs) We've got some things that uh, actually were not covered in the first episode that we want to uh, touch on. Um, so again, it's just going to be a discussion tonight. Um, and uh, we're excited that you guys have tuned in. So thanks for joining us. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Kristen. I was actually born um, in Jacksonville, Florida, in 1983. And I moved to St. Augustine with my family. And I spent majority of my childhood in St. Augustine until my adult life, which brought me to New Orleans. Um, this story spoke to me, um, listening to Christine's and April's podcast because my mother and I bonded over this story. This started out with the Bloody Sunset and St. Augustine book. Um, we were living in St. Augustine. I was seven when we moved there. Um, but this book came out in 1998, I think around like the early 2000s, it became another topic of conversation. It was brought back around. And my mom bought the book and told me that I would, sh- I should read it. And so we read it together and then we became little investigators and we drove by the house and we, you know, broke down the book. We were trying to figure out like how it could have possibly happened in broad daylight. Um, and then my mom had some interesting conversations with her inner circle about the fact that the good old boys in St. Augustine pretty much felt that Athalia Lindsley got what she deserved. And those words were spoken to my mother and it gave her goosebumps and it made her feel like, wow, this is incredible. It's such an incredible story um, for it to a happen in broad daylight for the person who's suspected of murdering her to get off scot-free. So it's kind of heartbreaking, especially because she lived in Jacksonville for a long time, which made her more of a Southerner and a part of the community than yeah. just those few years in New York. So right. for her to be considered an outsider was kind of sad. Um, I thought so- that too. I thought, you know, she's not, she was actually from, well, spent her youth there right before she moved to New York. Yeah. And then move back. So that's not really, that's not an outsider. She's buried in Jacksonville. Yeah. So, I mean, that doesn't, to me, it doesn't make you an outsider, especially when St. Augustine's a very small town um, and majority of its residents would have to go to Jacksonville. Like that day that she was murdered, she was in Jacksonville buying groceries because she couldn't get those specific type of groceries in St. Augustine. So, I mean, it's like a 30, 45 minute drive. So it's just right. sad that considered such an outsider um so one of the really most interesting things to me about this story florida had conducted a daylight saving time experiment and energy conservation it was 90 days ahead of schedule so they implemented daylight saving time daylight savings time 90 days early if they hadn't done that, it wouldn't have been broad daylight when she was murdered. It would have been like dusk or, um, you know, like twilight yep. because the police logged the call at 6.07 p.m. And in, if it wasn't for daylight saving time, it would have been darker. It would have not, it would have yeah. have been able to vividly say that was Alan Stanford murdering Miss Lindsley. Wow. Which is 
said to the investigators that day. That's right. Was that the neighbor? Yes. Yes. Yeah, the only eyewitness that came forward um, that day speaking about like physically seeing someone. However, there was a lead that was never explored. Um, B.O. Brunson was sitting on his front porch when a man drove south on Marine Street in a white Volkswagen. Uh, someone leaned out the window and yelled to Brunson that someone needed to call an ambulance because a lady had just um, up the street had just fell out of the window and there was blood everywhere. Now, if you could look at this house and, and know where she was on this front porch, which I'm pretty sure y'all posted a picture of the yeah, house. Yeah. The front porch is not huge. It's right. small. And there's Stoop. really no way for you to fall out of a window <laughs> onto the front porch. Right. Um, so it was, to me, that's an odd um, thing to holler out the window. <laughs> yeah. I fell out the window and landed diagonally into this small front porch and that there was blood everywhere. Um, so B.O. Brunson had uh, intended to <clears throat> stay at the scene and talk to police about this white car, this Volkswagen, but he was having chest pains. So he ended up going home that day. He didn't stick around to speak to the investigators that day. The next day he spoke to investigators, told them about the vehicle and that there was a young oriental looking man with bushy hair wearing either a long sleeve white shirt jacket or uniform that had screamed out of the window to call 911. Um, so he did mention five minutes before this car drove by, he thought he heard screams. So this lead was not explored. They did not track down this Volkswagen driver because Mr. Brunson died of a heart attack a few weeks after the wow. murder. Wow. That's the only one that would have been able to yeah. buy the driver. Wow. Um, my question on that is, is this a possible killer? Or could they have been an eyewitness to the murder? Could they have seen yeah. Alan? Right. Walk? One way or the other. Yeah. Wow. Oh, that's tragic. Yeah. But so that's actually an excellent point. And I just pulled up a picture of the house. And there is, okay, so the window above the front porch, on the window on the second story above the front porch is over a gable. So how, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. This body, I guess you could potentially be, I, I don't, I, I don't particularly think that there's any, um, merit to that just by looking at the picture. But I do think that this lead having not been explored, you know, there's, there could have been something there for sure. Well, and yeah. I feel like someone would have fallen out the window. There would be blood up there. There would have been yes. out Granted, the crime scene was obliterated by the paramedics, by the police officers, because St. Augustine at the time did not have a crime scene investigation unit. They called in the Jacksonville CSU later, but that was after the paramedics had already hosed off a lot of evidence. That's crazy. First thing they do is, oh, make sure you hose off all this blood. That's crazy. Yeah, I don't and I don't understand that. I guess because I watch so many in, like yeah. investigative <laughs> movies and television, like why a police officer, or even the paramedics would think that's something that's appropriate. I would think so. But then I thought, well, okay. In 1974, were they that savvy? Uh, yeah. I was thinking maybe they weren't that savvy. They didn't understand they uh, maybe type blood type. They could type blood maybe, but certainly not DNA. And so, and then also St. Augustine being um, the quaint, beautiful community it is, maybe, you know, just playing devil's advocate, maybe they were like, oh, this is a terrible mess, you know, let's clean this up. Um, like in today's st standard, yeah, it's like, whoa, why would they do that? Right. Yeah, so, it doesn't make sense. But no. It's just a part of the mystery. Right. You know? So I wanted to point out because Locke had stated in his initial, um, I want to say like description of the assailant. That that's the neighbor, correct? That is the neighbor. Yeah. So that's, that's the young boy who was essentially the only eyewitness. Right. Um, 
he stated that the man who murdered Athalia was wearing a white shirt with dark pants, which actually kind of worked with Theo Brunson's. Right. That's right. With so, that. Yeah. Just a lead that wasn't explored and could have led this whole thing down a different path. Yes, absolutely. Um, so I did want to say um, a few things uh, about Jink, the husband. Um, he was a very unlucky man. That's what I said. Three times unlucky for sure. Yeah. yeah. But what a what a horrible, a just sad life that right. he lived. And you know, one of the things that Christine and I talked about when I initially brought this story to her because it was one of those things like we were having an off the cuff conversation about her podcast and how excited I was for her and she had mentioned like well if you know any stories um and I was like oh I have a great one yeah and this one to me is a captivating story I mean how do you how do you not convict someone who murders a human being in broad daylight and how do you how are you okay with I mean granted this case had a lot of speculation there was a mountain of evidence that yeah. led towards Alan Stanford so right I just don't and sure there are like the leads that aren't explored and there's a few you know fishy characters thrown into the mix that have you know some an interesting background or a part in this but um for all of the things stacked up against Alan, for him to be acquitted, to me, was shocking. Right. Um, and I think that a large part of it is because St. Augustine is a, it's, it's a tight-knit group. And when you're an insider, you're an insider. Yeah. yeah. Part of the good old boys. And they're going to protect you. You know, they're, mm -hmm. they're not going to be okay with a man that, you know, goes to poker night or hangs out, goes fishing is convicted of murder so they're going to do what they can to right. help this man out oh uh, yeah and you you nailed it when you first said you know this woman um uh, that the comments were actually uttered that this woman got what she deserved you know they couldn't and especially in 1974 they couldn't handle a mouthy opinionated uh successful professional woman oh not at all uh, no. Like what? Who? Who is this trying to tell us what to do? Yeah, um, that's their mindset, I'm sure. So, um, one of the things that um, I thought was interesting is police who investigated this slaying have classified it as one of the most vicious attacks on an individual in the history of the more than four century old city. So, you know, St. Augustine was not the first settled, but it is the longest continuous city in the United States. And it does know its fair share of murders. And um, in fact, I actually had a, a friend of mine in high school that was murdered while mm. I was senior. Mm. Devastating. Wow. Yeah. Devastating. But um, this, the killer had to have acted in like a blind rage, mm -hmm. oblivious to the possibility that he would be seen and especially in broad daylight. Yeah. So for Locke, the eyewitness to initially state that it was Alan, then to recant his statement and his story changed throughout this entire police investigation to turn around and Patty Stanford, her story changes over and oh, over yeah. and over again yeah. and within the investigation. And then, you know, for me, um, having somewhat of an inside track, like my mom knows several people who lived in St. Augustine during this time. In fact, we had um, a friend of hers, her mother worked for the state attorney's office and was there when Alan Stanford came in and asked for the clothes that were a part of the evidence. Whoa. Um, he asked for them back. Okay. You so, can't do that. <laughs> well, I guess he thought he could. Wow. So I know you have some questions about particular uh, suspects, but yeah. I wanted to um, touch on this. So what we really don't talk about is, yes, Alan was acquitted 
um, and he uh, essentially walked free from this. Um, so post not guilty judgment, this is an interesting thing for me. Um, one of the jurors stated that they were hung up on the shoe size. Uh, the difference, which was a nine and a half D versus a 10 C. So the nine and a half D was what was in evidence. And apparently what Alan was wearing at the trial was a 10 C. They were hung up on this fact with all of the evidence, the mountain of evidence. Now, granted, they were given so many possibilities as to why Alan would do this. And they deliberated less than two hours. Wow. And one of the things that the juror was hung up on enough to where she went to the judge's house the next day after he was acquitted and told him that the shoe size was was what pretty much hung them up. Um, and it's only an eighth of an inch difference. Wow. The man could have I had worn larger shoes just to throw people off. In fact, why wouldn't you? Yeah. He seems like just the type of guy who would do such a thing. Exactly. Um, so I firmly believe based off of what I've read, what I've listened to, um, the stories that Alan was guilty. And so basically there was a Karen on the jury who was hung up on. (laughs) Oh, on the shoe size. Right. The trial investigation um, is often referred to as a comedy of errors, which collection of evidence is one of those um, errors, especially things that got omitted from um, being able to be used because of the way that the police collected the evidence. Um, and then the trial itself was considered a travesty of justice. Um, yeah. So a lot of people strongly believe that the jury freed a guilty man. Yeah. Um, and so interesting fact, six months after he was acquitted, an insurance company called the judge about a claim on the watch that was um, used as evidence in trial, a claim that Stanford had filed. So he was trying to essentially get his watch back. And the insurance company, or at least get, I'm assuming the money associated with the watch, Mm -hmm. um, the insurance company had to call the judge to confirm that it was actually put in evidence. So not only was he trying to get his clothes back, (laughs) But six months later, he's trying to get money for the watch. The watch. This is an arrogant guy. Well, so Some, double jeopardy is what comes into mind. Like, yeah. you know, it's not going to be right. Um, charged with murder of her again because right. he was a, so might as well get his stuff back. Right. And the, how arrogant. I mean, that sounds like somebody who would. Probably slash somebody until their head was decapitated. Yeah. You know? Well, she was literally knocking him down one by one. And right. that, I mean, he was essentially looking at losing his status, losing his job, um, that, and that money. Yeah, yeah. Losing that money. Right. And I feel like personally, if someone was attacking you personally, I would go into a blind rage. Would I murder somebody? No. But if someone dislikes me so much that they're that they're going to attack my character and they're going to take away my livelihood, right? This man not have been in some sort of blind rage. Oh yeah, it was personal for sure. Yeah, and nobody else had a motive like him. That matched that level of what was done to her because it, because it, it, broad daylight or even not, just how close you have to be to somebody to, even with a machete, to actually get. And then I forgot, oh, I forgot how many times that she, was it nine times that she was hit with this machete? I mean, that's, that's over and over and over. You're, you're up and close and personal with this person. And right, it no longer is murder, it's just blind, like right, it's overkill and it's you're rage unhinged at that point, right? And that's blood. And then they've, they've even um described when you're stabbing someone with an 
with some sort of knife or sharp object, like you can feel the blood is just warm when it like slashes back on you. So that's just like, because I guess what I'm trying to compare this to is it, it would be if somebody just wanted her dead they could go in with a gun and not have to get close. They, you know, shoot and then then you're gone and you're out of there. Other than like somebody just like wanted her to suffer. Well, I and mean, you have to think like her head was hanging on by a thread. Yeah. So that's a carotid artery. So you know that and, that is a constant blood flow. Right. And that was one of the, the main things with Patty is with Alan Stanford's wife is if he did do this, he would have been covered from head to toe in blood when he went home and she would have seen him. Yeah. And a lot of her friends um, said that she wouldn't have stayed with him if this was something that she went through. Like if she saw him in the shed covered in blood, she wouldn't have been like, Oh honey, let's, <laughs> let's go have dinner. Right. Um, but my thing is, is she didn't like Athalia Lindsley either. Right. And yeah. Her husband, husband was looking at, she had to have known. I mean, he, he had to have told her, like, she's literally right. going to take our livelihood away from us. Right. You kind of don't know what a partner would do in that situation. Um, but, you know, he after he was acquitted, he asked for his job back. Um, this is where I think that the good old boys were like, you know what? You're not guilty. However, in the court of public opinion, you are. You are no longer welcome in our community. And he pretty much was persona non grata. I mean, his reputation took a nosedive. And so they moved. They sold um, their house in 1975, and they moved to Miami. Just to, oh, I didn't realize that it was just the next year. Yeah, it was not long after the um after the after he was acquitted. Okay. Oh, he, that's he interesting. Get, yeah, he couldn't get a job. Right. Um I do think that uh deep down the town knew he was guilty, but right. they weren't going to convict one of their own because he was an insider and because he was so well connected. Because that's not just a stain on him, but it's a stain no. on all of the people that spent all of this money right. to keep afloat during the trial because they believed that he was not guilty, not knowing the type of evidence that was mounted up against him. They're learning within the trial that this man's probably not not that great. Right. Well, and then, and too, they didn't like her anyway, the city, you know, the town's folk. Had to admit that they that, were wrong. That they were, him. yeah. And that. Um, Putting him in that position. Yeah. Yeah. It's just an interesting thing. Um, and, you know, there are still people alive today that probably know what happened. And oh, they're yeah. keeping silent. Right. It, it, um, are y'all familiar with the um, Buford Pusser case? I think that's how you say it. Um, he basically terrorized a town. And... And then they, he was killed in broad daylight, and then they, like, no one saw a thing. It's It kind of reminds me of that, yeah. But anyway. That's what it, that's what it feels like, is that, oh. We got rid of this. Saw a thing. Right. We got rid of this person who was causing problems in St. Augustine, our quaint town. that We got a good thing going here. You know, nobody else is causing any waves or anything like that. It's, and it's, yeah, it's almost like, yeah, nothing to see here. He was acquitted. Let's get on with our, our normal lives. Yeah, they essentially out ousted him because it was a town divided. I mean, the yeah. Episcopal Church was pretty much divided amongst parishioners who thought that he was guilty versus the people who thought he was innocent and thought that Athalia deserved it. And I mean, Jinx and um, Athalia's best friend went to this church, but this church raised all of the money to help essentially acquit yeah. the, mur the presumed murderer. Right. Um, but so karma to me, this is um, a little bit of the tail end of what I wanted to say. Um, so they moved 
to Miami, and the rumors are that the two, um, Alan and Patty, separated. Um, which, you know, when I was listening to the book and then reading Bloody Sunset and St. Augustine and then listening to the newer book that came out, it does make sense because, I mean, that's a really bad year, <laughs> you know? Like, yeah. You go from having this wonderful life, um, it's picture perfect to it being completely dismantled. And they called it the curse of Athalia because she was trying to get him out of his job. And in life, she couldn't do it. But in her death, she pretty much dismantled him. Yes. So um, that's hmm. a, little, a little bit of karmic payback. But uh, so they, the two of them, Alan and Patty and their kids, they eventually um, settled in South Carolina. Patty died of lung cancer. Uh, but before she died, she created a, her own will separate from Alan, and she left all of her money, which was a significant amount of money, to her daughters. Nothing to Alan. Um, wow. However, she did make a mistake, and she made him the executor of her estate. So he had control. I guess the youngest daughter was still in her teens, so he had control of the money. The oldest daughter um, started noticing that a lot of the money was being like that first year of him having control of this estate. Um, a lot of money was being spent and there were no receipts to back up what he was doing. So he's essentially stealing from his children. Wow. The oldest daughter who her story on the stand changed quite a bit. Um, because there was speculation that the oldest daughter, Patty and I mean the oldest daughter and then the wife both saw Stanford covered in, blood and they essentially covered covered it up for him um patricia is the oldest daughter she went to battle with alan in court and they essentially settled out of um out of court yeah it wasn't like an official conviction but everybody everybody well i don't want to say everybody but like you said you know mm -hmm. it was. right i just um I guess maybe I'll just not really a question, but I'll just go over some thoughts that I had initially. Uh, uh, Jinx looked pretty good as a suspect. And um, because the whole blood trail that, that led up to the, led up to the neighbor's house, I thought, you know, because, and then too, they had some problems in their marriage. I mean, he doesn't, but um, that was pointed out. Um, I know some people made something of the fact that they didn't live together, but then also that was probably not a big deal. Well, Maybe were, today's were, standards. Yeah, they were working on selling, um, I believe, her house so they could live together. Right. Do, as far as he goes, there were so many witnesses to when they parted ways at his office for her to run home. For him to essentially, they were cooking dinner at his house. Yeah, okay. Um, there was too many witnesses because he stopped at a pharmacy and he crossed the Bridge of Lions to um, we call the island, but it's not that far. It's it's really just over the Matanzas Bay. Um, it's yeah. not. It's probably like a I want to say like maybe a seven minute drive, and I can't remember exactly what they um, documented as far as how long it would have taken him to get from his house, actually from the pharmacy to her house, to his house, to when the phone rang and yeah. they were seeking to come, your wife's been murdered, or there's this horrible scene. However, Jinx, before he left his house, before he went to Athalia Lindsay's house, he called his lawyer. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. So, and his um, lawyer met him there. Whoa. Okay. So that was suspicious. And I think that that's what part of what made him a suspect. Right. But there, the timing um, as far as from point A to point B, as well as the two investigators that were going to speak to Athalia that day about Alan Stanford, they had just passed in front of, I believe in front of her house right before she arrived. Um, and they were not planning on interviewing her. They just wanted to know where they were going the next day. Oh. Um, I think that they would have seen 
uh, Jinx if he would have driven up on that. It's just it's not a big street, so yeah. he'd be able to see cars. Like, yeah, he would have had to have parked and walked to not have been seen. Okay. Yeah, that was uh, I didn't know about that the lawyer. I just thought that I just and this is before Stanford started looking really good as a suspect for me. I thought, okay, if you wanted to take an opportunity to say get rid of your spouse, your uh, his wife, you, and you know that he has this big beef with the neighbor, you could lead the trail. But of course, I to me though, I don't think that that how it was described the problems in their marriage match the level of violence and violence in the uh you know the being hacked by machete to where you're almost decapitated yeah you'd have to think what changes from being dropped off at the um at her car at the office could trigger him into a blind rage right to just follow her home especially when they've had a lovely date day in jacksonville and she's planning this huge dinner to cook at his house so i mean right he did in the very beginning he did look very right he did and then the whole three times unlucky like you mentioned um i'm not saying that his because he had anything to do with his son but i even asked um our resident uh, authority on this how hard would it be to of course i'm referring to the (laughs) yes (laughs) just kidding so I'm like, how hard would it be to, in 1974, of course, I'm referring to the accident that killed his first wife, and then he was hit drunk, had been drinking, and I'm like, could that have, could he have done that? And then I was interested to know if maybe he had a life insurance policy out on him. I mean. Yeah, those are things that I don't think were actually covered as far as um, the investigative work that was done for both books. So that would be that's an interesting. Did he thing. have one on Athelia? Yeah, I I don't ever recall that being mentioned. I'll have to ask an insider and see. <laughs> okay, um, because because that was the other thing I thought maybe he's an opportunist. You know, yeah. so um, that was another question that I that I had. Um, also, though, okay, so there was um, help me out here that you had mentioned that his wife. Uh, St- Stanford's wife Patty kept changing her story that was one thing that was very suspicious that she couldn't nail down any times any they couldn't get she couldn't get the story straight about when her daughter was um at tennis you know and what time they came back what time they had supper that night and it, that kept changing but then there was also um uh, it was pointed out that her level of uh, fear or her daughters did not match. Like, here's somebody that, okay, you'd have to assume that that if she's thinking it's not her husband, then it's some rando out exactly. with a machete. I guess that, that that's also been pointed out that most people in Florida, St. Augustine, had machetes to, you know, whack down the, the foliage or whatever. But you'd have to um, think that, my gosh, you would have to, in 1974, the still innocent, you know, you'd have to think, I wouldn't want my kids out. And they said they were outside playing, the little girl. She, yeah. They, You're right, didn't were, lock the doors. I believe the older daughter was, um, had the youngest on a swing. In yeah. Their yeah. Not too long after the murder. Yeah, one of the things that was noted about Patty was, well, she was interviewed four times, um, and her story kept changing. Um, she had zero empathy for Athelia Lindsley okay. at, at all. And one of she actually, I think, lodged a lot of complaints um, with the city over very small things, petty things, the yeah. dogs. One of the things that stuck out to me was that everybody complained about Athelia Lindsley's dogs, but when all of this investigative work was going on when she was murdered, nobody heard dogs. Oh, weird. Weird. Yeah. Apparently they were the loudest dogs on the block, but the day their owner got murdered, they were silent. Nobody could hear. Oh, and you made me think of they hacked up the little bird. Yeah. I, I don't know how much of that was premeditated and maybe just like... Or there's a bird. She loved this little bird. 
you know, I, don't, I was wondering what the thought process was there. The bird in the cage, or was she in the process of putting the bird up? I can't right. remember. How, but, I mean, if he, presumably he, um, I think the evidence is leaning towards the he, uh, still had some aggression left over and went after an innocent bird. That's awful. Right. Awful. Absolutely. Like, she was nursing it. Y'all are making me question whether or not, like, Patty is sus. Like, oh, she could have been capable of doing something like that. Oh, whoa. And she might have had time to go change and clean up blood. Oh, that's interesting. You just change things. Mind really blown in this moment, but I, when y'all were having that discussion, that's what popped in my head. Oh, that that, that might be like a woman thing. Like I, I'm gonna kill you and your bird too. <laughs> I mean, I might be off base, but. You know. Well, so the one I don't know um, if you have any more April. Um. Oh, because just real, that- just real quick. I'm sorry. Just speaking of the whole Patty thing, and um, there was a um, there was evidence of a diaper, wasn't that? And then had blood and or paint on it, so that pointed to being in their shed. This- yeah, and that actually, I believe that evidence got thrown out because of the way that it was collected. So that actually yeah. was brought up to the jury um it, it actually yeah it mm-hmm. placed the murderer in their shed right because the significance being they had a uh, a three-year-old that she kept calling baby but i guess it's not a stretch to believe that they still had a, a cloth diaper that they it left over that they were using in the shed yeah and then the other um suspect was the guy who found the who cl- who collected the award the reward not an award the reward you get an award for collecting the most evidence the award for the, the most evidence so i don't really have any notes on him but in my mind what i think is for him to have known exactly where to go and look is perhaps he traveled that area a lot and happened to witness somebody dumping things but wasn't going to um, essentially rat them out because he was a part of the inner circle as well. Um, But I do think that as far as an opportunist goes, when there was a reward, he was like, oh, I know where that stuff is. I'm going to go get it. Right. And then I think it was implied in the book at least that's the way i took it was that the day that they were it's really weird what they were already having a trial and it was the day that they um announced the reward he found it he's like oh look what i found it's almost like it was ready to go or yeah. like hey here it is you go claim the reward yeah i do think that there was probably maybe an insider tip yeah. or maybe like i don't know if just in my head, like, I just picture him, like, pedaling his bike around and, like, out of the corner of his eye, he's, you know, right. something, dumping something in the lake or the pond. And they're like, he's like, hmm, I'm going to remember that. I don't well, know. Knowing Alan, he's like, I want my shit back. Hey, Dewey, go get my shit. Out of it. I'm just, you know. But, yeah, because that, that um, and we're, of course, we're talking about um, a whole slew of evidence, which was a watch, a belt, a shirt. Shoes. Right, and some shoes, and then um, these were also uh, claimed by people. Like, the tailor didn't the tailor identify this, and then the dry cleaner. There was a tag. Yep, and there was um, something with the watch that was identified as Alan, a jeweler. Um, I think he identified yeah. that. This is crazy. All the like you said, all the mounting evidence that just pointed to Alan. But. The juror thought it was important enough to point out that what hung them up was an eighth of an inch in the shoe size. Right. They had to overlook all that other coincidental thing. Mm-hmm. 
No, they, these were linked back to Alan, to okay, a suspect. Yeah, for sure. And, um, you know, the one thing that, you know, has just kind of nagged at me through this whole process of looking into this is the uh, her neighbor, Frances Bemis, um, who was actually, so she was a close neighbor and she was friendly with Athelia. Well, the same year in November of 1974, she's found murdered a block and a half from her house. And she's bl- she's was bludgeoned. Uh, I guess her skull was smashed with a concrete block, and that murder went unsolved. And there was some speculation or reports that um, she had been um, collecting or had collected information, and that she was planning to write a book or publish some sort of piece on what happened to Athelia. But there again, there's no suspects, there's no evidence, there's no conviction, obviously. It just is, it just goes away. Yeah, so what are the odds that two um, aging women live on the same street and they are, they're killed, like not the same way? But they're killed, and then one of them allegedly was going to knew a lot more about the um, Athelia's murder. Like that's crazy. But they did say, you know, she was giving the impression that she knew who murdered Athelia. But when they went through her will and went through her house, there was zero notes. There was zero evidence that she was writing a book about it, and there was no indication whatsoever, based off of. Um, the belongings that she had in her house that she actually knew who murdered Athelia. So quite confusing as to why she would give that impression. Um, and was that the catalyst that got her murdered? Or an opportunist. Yeah, an, an opportunist. And like Christine mm-hmm. said, maybe the person who murdered her broke into the house and destroyed the evidence. Oh, they never investigated it any further. They didn't go inside her house? I don't, I, I'm not sure if they went inside her house. Um, I, well, I don't really, really read up on her murder. I just know that the links between the two were very interesting. Very. They're on the same street. And like you yeah. just said, um, there was in St. Augustine in 1974-ish, how many... Well, yeah, uh, how many women on the same street were killed, like, in the same, like, age bracket? You know, the odds are just kind of crazy. Yeah, I mean, could there have been a potential beginning of a serial killer? Yeah, maybe so. Could it have been completely unrelated to Alan, and all of that just happened to unfold the way it did, and maybe that person who killed both of them moved on to a different town. I mean, oh, maybe so. No, it's the, the list could go on and on and on. Yeah. Tourist could be vagrant. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh yeah. And then we mentioned this on our episode, but the fact that Alan had borrowed a machete and never returned it. Well, and there was actually, so that and there was blood on the pole um, near his work, too. So, uh, yeah, where he parked his car, where or I believe it was a car truck. I can't remember. Either. Which I was trying to figure out how, if that was him and related to Athelia's murder, how did that fit in? Like, that was just something maybe he put us touch the sign in some capacity? So supposedly he went back to the office because he forgot something or he went a, a, a protractor. To go back to get a protractor. Which yeah. is, I don't know about 1974, but okay, what? Maybe he got out of his vehicle and still had blood on his hand and touched the, the pole. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not sure, but I mean, there was just so many things that just don't. Right, right. That don't add up, but. 
It's like, make sure you got, I got to have my protractor. I can't, it can't wait into the morning, honey. I got to go get my protractor. I, I got it. Listen, babe, I, I got to go back to the office. I forgot my protractor. And then he went searching and searching and searching for an alibi. Somebody in that area to claim that they saw him going back to the office to get the protractor. <laughs> And they never materialized. So, and they ne- he couldn't find anybody that oh, said that God. they saw him. But he's saying he's there, and there's blood right mm-hmm. there. Yeah. He the car, right, so. right. And to your point, Jinx had many people who alibied him, and he was just going back to his house to have dinner. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, if he wouldn't have stopped at that pharmacy, I don't think... Um, I think it would have been a different story. He had several people who saw him at the pharmacy. So. Right. And that, that is true. That sounds like somebody who has no idea that his wife's being murdered. Yeah. So, yeah. I, okay. So, I'm still leaning toward Alan. I say Patty. I don't. I like that, though. I like that a lot. Good job, Christine. I agree. Good job. Hey, it, you guys gave me the idea, so I'm just going with it. I don't know. I, I just, wow. Because, you know, that sounds like a woman thing now. Right? Just to get well, so emotional. I, I thought of when you said that, you know, you, you were describing like, you know. F your uh, bird. Yeah. Like just so. And I was like, the light bulb went off in my head. So I'm I, running with it. That sounds like an emotional woman. No, you're you're probably right. I like it. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, once again, you know, I just want to say thank you to Kristen. Um, you know, first and foremost for uh, sharing the idea with us, but now definitely coming on and. Um, you know, sharing your knowledge about it. And, uh, you know, this is a first for the show. So we're honored and thank you. Yes. Thank thank you. It was um, very exciting. I was super nervous at the beginning. I'm sure you could tell my voice, but that's normal. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) You did great. Thank you. Thanks everybody for listening. We'll be back with our regularly scheduled program. Thank you. Go back to what you were doing. Absolutely nothing. (laughs) Me? Who? What? You got a? You got you shit? You got feathers and you shit out your butthole <laughs> in a tree? What? Are you, what are you an owl? Who me? <laughs> Finally get to meet my brother. Right. <laughs> Have you? Do you didn't warn her? <laughs> Sounds like our mom. When are we gonna get up another one? <laughs> um. Whenever we, <laughs> Christy. At first, she was like. Let's do it every week. We're going to do every week because I get mad when my favorite podcast, you know, have to wait two weeks. Now we're lucky if we do it once a month. Okay. I'm putting that in the podcast. <laughs> blue for real. Okay. So just real quick, what do y'all want me to do? Because <laughs> I feel like I'm not doing anything. Just do what Christy usually does on most of the other ones. Just. <laughs> Kind of sit there and she's not this time though. She's got to say be- something like every. You're not recording yet, are you? Yeah, but we won't use this. I think it's just you know sharing. Sharing makes us all happy. Sharing. Well, April just asked, "What do you think a woman can do that with a <laughs> knife?" I'm like, "There's a show about it." And thanks, everybody, for listening. And we'll be back for a regularly programmed schedule. I know words. I have the best words. Regularly scheduled program. Regularly. What's Brewery. Regularly. Regularly. <laughs> 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 be back for our next regularly programmed schedule. It didn't even sound weird to me at all. I'm not weird. Anyway. Like, yeah, that's right. We will. (laughs) It was just words. They just weren't in the right order. Stupid. You've been listening to Southern Discomfort with April and Christine. As you can tell, this is one of the most unique podcasts on the internet. 
so we want you to be able to reach out to us. Send emails to Southern Discomfort Podcast at gmail.com, on Facebook at Southern Discomfort Podcast, and on Instagram at Southern Discomfort PC. And for shows, visit Southern Discomfort.podbean.com. And this podcast can be found anywhere you get your podcasts. Till next time, keep one eye open because you never know what you might see. This is Southern Discomfort, signing off.